technically based off of a lot of macro indicators we are in a bear market again you know the the weekly ema cross if you're into that kind of thing has crossed bearish so we are we would be technically in a, in a bear market according to many macro indicators if you're looking at a super cycle as a systemic indicator we are technically still in a bull market we might just be in a trough uh before a, a big pump we're also in an election cycle tends to be the case that election cycles are bullish. We have seen a bit of a bull market prior to this sort of like very down and crabbish and choppy uh, portion. I think that's because there's just a lot of uncertainty. Welcome to the Never Die Podcast, your weekly crypto alpha for those who never quit. Today, I'm talking to Steven from DeFi Dojo. Originally, this podcast was meant to be about DeFi. Uh, he's like an expert in DeFi. It's, all he does is like chase down yields and the best yield opportunities in crypto. And he's like just a genius when it comes to that. Uh, but the conversation kind of got derailed pretty early on. And we ended up talking a lot more about like the frontier of crypto and where crypto is going in where we can get real yield from and where that might come from in the future and what crypto overall is building as a whole. So if you're really into uh, crypto and the vision of crypto and where we might end up, what this is all going towards, what it might become, uh, and, and you want some really interesting thoughts and ideas around that, this episode is going to dive full force into that. We do talk about some DeFi stuff and some, some yield stuff in there, as well as we talk a little bit about uh, some politics when it comes to poly market and uh, why uh, currently Kamala's odds on poly market might not be as high as you think for a very specific reason I've never heard before uh, that Stephen pointed out that I thought was genius. I, I've never heard this this argument before, but I, it made a lot of sense once he said it. So we, we tap into a lot of those things uh, in this episode, but it's, it's mostly a, a frontier-focused episode on where's crypto going, what is the cutting edge of crypto today, and what might it become tomorrow. Let's jump into it. All right. Well, just to start us off, can you give us a little bit of your background and how you got started in crypto? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, like many people in this space, I, I got into crypto the wrong way, which is uh, in college <laughs> with the Silk Road and trying to find interesting ways to do interesting things. Not the best way to get into crypto. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, <laughs> la uh, later I've never on heard it. So I say that you got involved in crypto with through Silk Road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could, all my, you know, I had friends and they were like, check out this website on the deep web. And I was like, whoa, you can do all this crazy stuff. I was like, yeah, you have to buy it with Bitcoin. I was like, Bitcoin, why is it $65? That's crazy expensive. Uh, and you know, now it's insanely high. Uh, and I used Wait, to did like, you get a lot of Bitcoin back then. No, I, I, uh, I didn't like, I, you know, we were looking at it sort of as a, I don't want to dox anyone in their illegal activities, but effectively they were buying things from the Silk Road and having them delivered uh, to their place. And they would say, well, you know, I have to buy Ethereum or Bitcoin in order to purchase these things. And I remember Ethereum at the time was, I can't really remember what it was, but it was like either single digit or double digit dollars. And then the next time they went to buy something on the Silk Road, it was like, you had the Ethereum cost so much more. And I was like, whoa, this is ridiculous. Like, what's going on? Are the, the prices going up? Like, no, 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 the Ethereum just costs more. I'm like, huh, terrible. Uh, not very stable currency. <laughs> Did not think of it as an investment. But many years later, uh, Ethereum broke, like, I think it was $400. It was in a, in a bunch of news. Uh, and I thought, you know what? I know a little bit about crypto. I've, I've dabbled in it before. Let me get into this. And so... I think that was 2017, and it uh, it was great. I you know I was a teacher at the time, not making a bunch of money, so my small investment did okay. I uh, tried to trade. I was a terrible trader, and so I didn't really get in DeFi until 2019 when one of my buddies was like, "Nodes," and I was like, "I don't know what that is." And they're like, "You walk up your money, and it just keeps growing." And I was like, "That sounds fantastic." Uh, so I did that, and it really worked out. And it, it was definitely a Ponzi scheme. It was strong block. Uh, some people know me as like the strong block guy, which is a horrible way to be known uh, back in 2019 when I had no idea what tokenomics were or how DeFi worked or how economic models worked or what tokenomic models did um, but it was it was a great Ponzi while it lasted and so that got that like wet my whistle into the DeFi space and after I realized this is completely unsustainable like there's no way that this number can continue to go up because that means we'll all be billionaires in a few years and that's just not gonna happen uh, I you know then ohm hit and I followed that and I watched the tokenomics there and then I got into LPs and I was like, okay, so there is a way to get organic yield where people are actually paying for a service, which is liquidity provision, organic yield from uh, borrowing lending platforms. I started creating these things I called calculators, which were spreadsheets. That's how I got my name as the calculator guy. People wanted to learn about the spreadsheets. 
and then I, you know, built a Discord and built a YouTube and built a Twitter, and uh, I guess the rest is kind of history. Wow. Okay, that's that's like a big story. I feel like the the Ponzi's kind of got everyone. You know, a lot of people shy away from them, but there were so many people that were involved in those things, and it was hard to measure at the time because unless you had like a background in like you know uh, structuring financial products, it, it was hard to understand like why these things or how these things could go awry when they were working for so long. Right. And now in retrospect, that feels stupid. And you're just like, Oh, it's so obvious. But being new to it, it wasn't quite as obvious. Well, we all had to pay our tuition. I feel like we had a, a class of a ton of freshmen come into DeFi because DeFi really only had one cycle before 2019. And that cycle was Uniswap. And then like the, the, uh, infamous pink or sushi swap vampire attack and then all of these you know master chef contract forks and the food farms like that was DeFi version one and then DeFi version two was mostly these ponzi's and these forks of forks of forks of forks of forks and then money markets and things like that DeFi version three which is what we're in now is insane and i think each cycle the collective intelligence and also just like the iq of people coming into the space and being interested in it has uh dramatically shifted i think no longer is safe moon and uh you know ohm or strong block going to be the thing that brings people into DeFi? it's going to be something hopefully a lot more robust and sustainable yeah i always think of when i look at those the ponzi seasons there's actually it's uh, hard to say but there's actually some good that came out of it and that's that what you essentially had was uh, mass experimentation about like how can we do tokenomics and what yeah. are some creative things we could do with tokenomics and obviously most of it didn't stick but there are, there are things that got carried over and then adopted and i actually think we'll probably see something if we have the same kind of crypto bull run people are going to always kind of run down that chain of like opportunity right and when they get to the bottom of the barrel it's going to be ponzi's because it always is ponzi's and they're going to be way more complicated than last cycle where it's going to be really hard to tell. But, you know, you, you get some new financial derivatives, some new kind of ways to do tokenomics out of those experimentation seasons mm -hmm. uh, that, that do ultimately improve DeFi, I think, as a whole. I think VE tokenomics is one of the biggest innovations from like the, the Ponzi model uh, that came from all this. It's like the, the combination of uh, the MasterChef incentive model plus governance plus a little bit of Ponzi, which is you need new buyers and investors into the, the underlying governance token in order to sustain the yields of the other users. So uh, I think there are protocols trying to build flywheels that that at their very core still depend on new users and new interest in the governance token, uh, but that are much more appealing to to even more sophisticated adopters. Yeah, because we all kind of learn this, even the, all the devs, the devs and stuff, they got like a master class in like economics and how things work. Uh, we, we learned it on the fly. Like yield was like a new thing in crypto. We're like, oh, cool. Yield. This is crazy. What can we do with this? And <laughs> I think we figured a lot. Uh, we figured out a lot about what we can't do with it uh, by, by yeah. trying those things like, hey, let's print free money for everyone. Let's see if that works. Oh, cool. Hey, 6,000% uh... APR. <laughs> yeah, it, it got up to a billion. Uh, there were some projects. There's some own forks that were doing a billion percent. That's and right. I remember a friend like telling me like, hey, you should get into it. And I'm like, that is stupid. And then like a week later, he's like, bro, it's been working for a week. I'm making so much money. And I'm like, what? Like, that's not possible. And obviously yeah. it eventually collapsed. Um, right. But, you know, there was a season where all this stuff was weirdly just working in, in, in a bull mm -hmm. market. And um, a lot of people were making a lot of money. H have you stayed up to date on Olympus and kind of what they've done? Uh, not not up to date, up to date. I know that they went from Ohm, which was like the, the big thing, then Geom, which was their wrapped version. Effectively, like if you guys followed Time, Time had Memo. Memo was their wrapped version of Time, so it was effectively the interest-bearing version of it. Uh, with Geom, they tried to make that composable across DeFi for a while. You could borrow against it on a bunch of these sort of novel type money markets. Rari Fuse was the big one. And then eventually they created the, I forget, it's like the something, something, something. It's the stability Rain mechanism. Range bad stability. There we go. Yeah, exactly. And they kept it around $10 for, for quite a while. And it was a pretty interesting mechanism. I liked it a lot. And the APRs were decent if you paired it against like USDC so, or ETH. So I thought that was a really cool product. But then as soon as I was getting back into it, they started to wind it down. And I was like, ah. No, uh, no, they're still doing range bound stability. So they still have that going. Um, if you actually look at the price of Geom over since uh, like through Terra, the Terra collapse, it's been, it's been like a, just a steady climb up only. It's uh, remained stable through the FTX collapse, all of that. It's, it's been one of the most interesting experiments in, in crypto that I feel like a lot of people haven't paid attention to. They, they eventually did uh, cooler loans. I don't know if you heard about that. Right. It was yeah, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
you could take out a loan against your own at 0% interest at a 95% loan to value ratio. Um, My assumption with that was that the, the, or at least this was like the, this was the flack they got was that the existence of cooler loans was for people who are holding geom or ohm to be able to exit without selling a la mitch from curve yeah i i got a lot of people saying that too but it's still been performing pretty well and i said zero percent interest it isn't it's like a sorry 0.25 percent but there's no liquidation is what it is there's no liquidation and so um that that's how it originally launched and i actually ended up doing it so i took a huge chunk of my eth i just bought yeah. a bunch of geom and then I took a loan out against it, 95%. So I was taking a 5% drawdown. And then I took that um, and I just bought back my ETH. And so now I hold two positions. And um, I'm actually up on my Geom since doing that about, I actually, a pretty, I took a lot of ETH and did this, okay? I, I'm up about $50,000 on my Geom since doing this. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's That's great. So it has Geom in, well, I guess it depends on the interest rate. Oh, yeah. Holy cow. So, so Geom was like stable from, uh, March, let's just say March of 24 until nearly July and then shot up 20% uh, recently. Yeah. And that's because they're doing like a burning mechanism. So now they're taking like mm. the yield they get from their, the D, the die savings rate, I think. Right. And they're using that to buy back and burn ohm. Love it. Keep it going. <laughs> do, do it forever. <laughs> It's just a crazy experience. If you think about range bound stability, if you think about how they bootstrapped right. the protocol initially, the giant treasury they've built up, cooler loans, I, it's, I, I've not seen more experimentation on like just like a playground level. And the fact that it's like yeah. this DAO, this like people are shifting in and out of and just trying new things. It's just, I don't know. In the, the DeFi space, I've always found it to be like really fascinating and um, just a really interesting experiment. And a lot of those guys have gone on to build other things too. They've like the, the Ohm team started a lot of other protocols and also tried to experiment in in many different ways. I think some a lot of the Barra team like originally came from the Ohm team. Yeah, they're everywhere, man. They're really everywhere. Um, I think there's uh, there's like something on. Um, I'm blanking on it. What is uh, the the Ponzi chain? It's not a Ponzi chain, but like the yield chain. Um, Blast. There's something on Blast where yeah. uh, they launched Yes, I think what it is. And so that's mm -hmm. from the Ohm guys where it's like it literally is a Ponzi um, and they're just fully embracing it. It's just like uh, supposed to just continually go up or whatever. But yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, you just mentioned Ohm and I, not a lot of people talk about it or even think about it. But um, yeah, it's just just interesting to me. Yeah, it was one of my one of my quote unquote stablecoin favorite stablecoin yields during the bear market because of the range bound stability. It stayed in a decent range and it got around 30 percent APR. Uh, so I liked that for a while. And this was sort of leading up until cool loans when cool loans came out i started ignoring it i guess i did the opposite of what you did you jumped into it uh, i should have taken your lead instead of you taking mine <laughs> i um well i think my obsession with it really comes down to i think that probably the most killer crypto product that's going to exist is going to be a, some sort of decentralized stable asset yeah. and i don't think it's going to be pegged to the us dollar but i think it's going to be something where it's like free floating but stable and so the only team that I really see doing some crazy experimentation around this in, in, the, in the way that I'm thinking is Ohm, where it's like it's a very free-floating asset. It can go up, it can go down, and they've it's not just 2024. If you go all the way back to 2022 and look at it, it stayed really, really stable. Like look at where the Terra collapse was and look at where FTX collapse was, and it's like, wow, like this thing has been – more stable than just about anything else. Yeah, I mean, I can't really argue with that. There have been some other attempts to back reserve currencies that are effectively like stable coins with more of a floating range by gold, Bitcoin, Ethereum. Um, I can't remember. There's one that's like at the back of my mind. I can't really think of it. Uh, and then there is a bunch of CDPs, right, which are stable coins minted against uh, collateral. Now, Vitalik always... He doesn't crap on these, but he says like the, the issue with these is scaling. We can't always have more ETH in stable coins. Or stable coins are one of the primary uses of crypto. And I get that and I agree with that. But then these solutions are always really unsavory because they're centralized. They're they're tether or circle or some issuer who can issue stable coins against like real world fiat. Yeah. I've thought about that, that kind of model of like Bitcoin ETH and maybe like a mix of actually fiat in there too and finding the right proportion. Somebody's gonna fix. Somebody has to figure it out because I, right now it, it feels like we're playing Monopoly, like the whole world is, and like the U.S. is the bank, and we just print as much as we want, and it just right. doesn't seem like if I was another country, I'd be like, this really isn't fair, uh, you know, for for us, and so it feels like 
a, a more neutral sort of currency, but it has to be stable, would be ideal. And uh, maybe when Bitcoin and ETH kind of achieve uh, breakout velocity, they'll be a lot more stable and this will be a lot easier to do. Um, I've always kind of imagined it'd be built in some way using ETH as like a, a major building block. Well, you know, LUSD is about to launch, uh, what is it called? Bold soon, which is which is liquidity V2. So maybe okay. that'll be enticing. Yeah, and we have all the, um, we have all the like, LRT, um, stable coin, like, are you familiar with Prisma? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, their, their token is not done very good. But like them and like, um, it was redacted, but now De Niro, I think uh, they have, um, well, they have an LST backed stable, but there, there's all these interesting kind of models where they are t- trying to right. take ETH and, and use it to build some sort of stable. Yeah, Liquidity Forex CDP protocols, uh, many of them very interesting, but all of them effectively the same problem, which is people are using the stablecoin to leverage. And if you're using a stablecoin to leverage, the stablecoin is going to have inherent sell, sell pressure, and so all of them depegged. And then the people who are trying to arbitrage that peg can only redeem for the underlying collateral, which typically is ETH. And if it's stable coins, uh, then the people providing the loans can get effectively liquidated or, or I guess, bought out without their knowledge. And this redemption mechanism made a lot of people very angry. Thinking through this cycle, I actually want to talk about yields and kind of where you're making money right now. But I, because we're on Ponzi's and tokenomics and all this experimentation, Obviously, there will be Ponzi's this cycle, no doubt in my mind. Like people are going to figure out a way to try to make Ponzi's this cycle and people are going to fall for it. You're like really deep in the DeFi space and kind of the advancements that have been made. Uh, try to imagine how, how do you think they're going to the Ponzi's are going to look and maybe some of the differences between last cycle and this cycle? Ooh, that's a hard question to answer. Um, <laughs> it is. Yeah. So I right now, I would say the big scheme the big DeFi scheme is points uh i wouldn't call it a ponzi scheme though i I have heard that accusation from some bigger teams that i know Uh, i think the point system has overtaken the old master chef contract so for those of you who don't know the master chef contract just means there is some yield and now uh, that yield comes from organic places whether it be swap fees or interest rates and on top of that this is the master chef contract on top of that you can also get governance tokens so this came from uh, SushiSwap, where they forked Uniswap, and so people were getting trading fees, plus they were getting Sushi tokens. That Master Chef uh, capacity to emit additional governance tokens allowed anyone to give whatever APR they wanted just by spitting out free tokens. And that kind of ruled the last half of last cycle, after most of the Ponzi forks sort of died away and, and were no longer profitable past you know two days. Uh, this cycle, they've sort of de-incentivized or disincentivized the master chef model because people sort of got really tired or exhausted of it last cycle and they've replaced it with points which is effectively the same thing except you get your yield in the far and distant future and you have to speculate on its value all the way until the date of the airdrop i think like right now that's dominating the cycle and if there is some way to turn that into a ponzi scheme i think people will be familiar enough with the incentive system to potentially be lured into it uh, unknowingly. So I think points may be the, the stepping or starting point for the Ponzi. Maybe it's like airdrops. I think Tia and Dimension uh, both had this narrative of if you buy and stake Tia, then you will get airdrops. And that pushes up the price of Tia. And then these speculative airdrops could also be used for more airdrops. So you get Tia, you stake it, you get dimension. From that airdrop, you stake dimension. You then get the next airdrop and you stake that, et cetera, et cetera. That is kind of adjacent to a a Ponzi-esque system uh, because all of these things were supposed to provide some layer of security using like the eigen restaking methodology. And that doesn't scale because there's not enough demand for that security. So uh, the real value came from the speculative airdrops. Yeah, I've always thought about that too. Like, um, so so past cycle, just to kind of summarize what you're saying. So past cycle it was like uh, you would stake and you would get a direct yield, and that was like DeFi, and it was really straightforward but really unsustainable because the yields were insane. And this cycle, they figured out, hey, we can't do that. People kind of got, they, they kind of understood it, so they did. It's almost like a variable reward system where you're not, maybe you're staking, maybe you're not staking, but like kind of the same concept. You take a token, you do something with it. And um, then you get a yield or reward, but it's variable. You don't know if you're going to win or you're going to lose. You're going to actually get an airdrop. You're not going to get an airdrop. It's going to be big or it's going to be small. Um, and this system 
worked for a while. And actually, I mean, I made a ton of money from airdrops. I made over 2023 and 2024, I made probably over 100K, which is crazy. And I got mm. really lucky. I got really lucky with a couple where I, I it did some things that I didn't know was going to give me an airdrop. And the airdrops ended up being huge. Um, yeah. But it does feel like it's kind of run its course now. And mm-hmm. on some level, we have to find a new something, something else, something new. Uh, because it feels like every airdrop, everyone's just really angry, and they're not happy, no matter how much money they make. What do you? Th- yeah. What do you think the new thing's going to be as far as airdrops? Well, it, it's a good point that uh, airdrops were super exciting when no one was expecting them, and people love to be pleasantly surprised and not disappointed. And even if the return is incredible, I think EtherFi Season Two was a great example of a very high return. I think the average APR for the average user was like sixteen percent, or even up to twenty five percent, and they got a pretty big airdrop, net positive. People were still mad because it, it wasn't so big as their very first airdrop, or so big as the very first Tia airdrop, or so big as the Dimension airdrop. Uh, so very high expectations even if you do deliver a decent airdrop people are going to be upset and you have to play into the psychology of the of the market so there are going to be a few more airdrops there are some points campaigns still going on renzo season three is going on right now i i layer is supposed to do their uh liquidity generation event uh september 30th we'll see if that actually happens um that that should either be a massive flop or like a people will be very happy. We'll see. I think it's going to be super binary and market conditions may vary. So what is the, the next thing? Well, it's, it's, uh, it has been recently farming chains, which is weird, right? So we used to farm protocols. Now people are farming chains. And what that means is either you're on a place like Linnea or Scroll or Blast farming the points of a chain to get some L2 airdrop in the future, which we've all played the airdrop points game. Maybe it'll work out. Maybe it won't. I think mode was an example of where it didn't quite work out the way we thought it was going to work out. Many L2s were launching at, you know, multi-billion valuations. Had that happened, mode would have been a great airdrop. Mode launched at like 700 million and then is now down to less than 200 million. Uh, So it ended up being a disappointing airdrop despite being a good percent of FTV in terms of the, how big the airdrop should have been. So farming chains to the airdrop side of things is still very speculative might not work out farming chains incentive packages has been doing okay but it's not nearly as enticing or interesting uh, in terms of aprs so op superfest is a is an awesome example um, arbitrum l tip is another fantastic example of these big giant incentive packages coming from the chain itself rather than at the protocol level that are bringing in a lot of TVL onto the chain, getting a lot of those good metrics, potentially for future raises, and then also providing really good yields. So like right now, I'm looking at Contango and I'm seeing 30%, 40% APRs on uh, leveraging up wrap staked ETH on base chain on Aave because super fast OP incentives are going over there. So what you're saying is the chain itself... Um, which they do, maybe they have VC money. They typically have a lot of money to kind of dole out. They want to attract liquidity and users to their chain. So they're paying out incentives. And as, uh, as somebody in DeFi, you're going and farming these incentives. And so it's like, maybe it's not fully real yield in some cases, because a lot of times it's their own token. Um, but it's kind of in between like the super, you know, fake yield and real yield in this kind of like gray area where you're like, you're able to cash out, you're making good money. And that's the current frontier. Yeah, I mean, the, the best case scenario is getting 100% APR and organic yield. Uh, that is so hard to do, and it always relies on interest rates or crazy high volume on swap fees. The next best thing is these immediately realizable, pretty liquid token incentives. So it's kind of like you're going back to the, the master chef of yesteryear, uh, but instead of farming protocol tokens, you're farming chain, you know, L2 t- tokens. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um... And Merkle's yeah, they're, taking they're, over they're, here. I don't know if you're familiar with Merkle, but Merkle became the spot for all these incentives to get emitted. Uh, and so it's kind of interesting that last cycle, virtually all protocols had their own tokens being emitted directly on their protocol. Now, most of them are doing packages via Merkle where you'll have to go and do some activity and then claim your incentives on this third-party system, which is uh, Merkle done by Angle. And the the kind of cool advancement here is that with Merkle, you can specify the type of activity you want to incentivize. So let's say you want liquidity that provides support for your token. So effectively, you want like deep 
downside liquidity and sort of thin upside liquidity. You can incentivize that specific type of liquidity, which forces users to, to build those structures for you, uh, rather than just incentivizing any liquidity and not having a lot of say over what happens. Mer is it, it's uh, so Merkle's like a crypto app. I've never heard of this. Whoa, man, I, I would love to, uh, to share this with you. Yeah, this is Mer M E K M E R K L. So M E R K L dot angle dot money. And you can, they, they're incentivizing on, I mean, I don't know, over 30 chains, uh, but basically protocols go and they use Merkle, they deposit their incentives into Merkle and then Merkle allows you to claim those incentives if you do the underlying activity. And you don't need to deposit any money into Merkle. Merkle's completely non-custodial. Merkle just looks at the chain and sees, are you doing the incentivizable activity? And if you are, you qualify for these incentives. So like you, you might even have Merkle rewards just from doing on-chain activity. Let's say you were uniswapping wrap stake to ETH for a long time. You may have qualified for some Merkle campaigns. Got it. So this, it's almost like a, um, like a live airdrop, like, um, ongoing, yeah. you know, more focused airdrop where it's like, Hey, here's the incentives. Go do this thing. You get the reward. Um, I mean, we've seen, we've seen similar models like this with, um, there's all these social platforms kind of like that right. where you, maybe you're getting, again, points or whatever. But this seems maybe more targeted and sustainable long term. Sustainable. I mean, we'll see. So it, we're always running into the same problem, which is people are giving out freeish money to generate users and activity. And the the best case scenario for protocols is that the organic or the forced or incentivized volume and fees uh make enough money for the teams to build a runway. The more insidious reality is that they're using incentives to generate metrics like users, volumes, and fees to then use those maybe artificially generated metrics to do a raise to get more runway. Uh, both are models. I think the first one is more savory than the second one, but the second one is certainly pretty common. Yeah. Uh, so what would you say, maybe let's outline some of the real yields opportunities in crypto. Um, I would say like, you know, maybe there's like swap fees, there's providing liquidity, um, there is borrowing and lending. Where else are you seeing places where there's like genuine, there's like a genuine business model and the yields, we know where the yields coming from and it's like sustainable. Ooh, I like this. So sustainability, USDZ is a really interesting, this is Anzen, a uh, really interesting stablecoin that is backed by credit markets, um, off-chain credit markets. So uh, I forget that, I think it's not, it's not Prisma, it's something like that. If I went, I could look at it, but basically they take the TVL of the of what backs the USDZ. They participate in credit markets, which if you guys don't know what credit markets is, it's basically bonds to businesses. So you make a loan to a business, they pay it back with an interest rate. These tend to go between 10 to 25% with varying risk levels. Uh, and because these this stablecoin is backed by these credit markets, it can have an intrinsic yield of between 8 and 15%, uh, with also having some sort of uh, treasury or insurance model in the event that one of these defaults. And even when credit markets default, it's not like a total loss. It's a small loss. They'll do some sort of clawback, whatever it is. So I think Anzen has a sustainable model because credit markets will always exist. Uh, and these are tapping into business, like real world business loans. There's also like SDI and USDM and all these stable coins that are backed by treasury bills. Treasury bills aren't going anywhere. They're a little bit more reliant. I mean, they're totally reliant on the US government interest rate, whereas credit <laughs> markets are less reliant, but still affected by the interest rate. Uh, so, th those, so both those things scale. Then we have Athena, which is backed by the ca cash and carry trade or the carry trade of, of ETH. So it's long ETH, and then short ETH on a perp market, you're getting funding for that perp. That perp is effectively paying you the yield. That yield right now is not super interesting. It's 4.17%. I calculate it on a weekly basis using the smart contracts. They advertise a little bit higher. It's not that. It's 4.17%. And that's cool, uh, but you can't really loop or leverage that because the borrowing cost of stable coins tends to be around there anyway. So you, can't, you can only do so much with that. In terms of other yields on-chain that are, that are sustainable... Uh, the staking rate of ETH is around 3%. And looping that has been the most consistently good way of getting an organic yield on Ethereum for a while. Uh, and many protocols have tried to solve the low interest rate problem. 
I think Morpho did a great job with this. Morpho had one of the lowest rates to borrow ETH, so you could get like 12 to 25 percent organic yield, all based off staking rate. Uh, and right now, because the cost to borrow ETH is low and the cost to stake is decent, you can go on, you can lend APX ETH on Morpho and get 50 percent uh, organic through looping and leveraging. So. That's kind of cool, but probably not sustainable forever. You feel like, I often feel like this, that the reason that we lack a lot of diversity in the ways to generate yield on chain actually comes from like uh, the regulatory landscape because I feel like it'd be so fun and so awesome if any company on the planet could launch just like a crypto project and raise money. They don't have to go to VCs. They go direct to uh, investors like you and me, and they're like, hey, we're going to launch this you know, X tech company, it's going to compete with Instacart or we're, you know, mm-hmm. launching this co- uh, company to f- you know, cure cancer, right? Like, you know, whatever. Uh, so like VC, the VZ model uh, gets kicked out and instead anyone can invest early stage into these mar- in these markets and products. And it's a, a lot more of an efficient model because uh, for one, uh, they're going to raise more mo- capital and you're, you're leaving it to the global open markets to kind of do the due diligence. And um, I think ideas and capital get spread out a lot more Uh, versus having to kind of like do this specific route of like going to Silicon Valley and kind of knowing the right people and knowing what to say, et cetera. Yeah, definitely. We've seen smaller versions of this. I think Goldfinch is one example where you have uh, people lending to borrowers and those rates, the yields are better because the risk is higher. Uh, And I think the yields are better because the risk is higher. So even if we did have a totally decentralized model, uh, it would have to be really, really high interest rates, which might not be competitive for those startups. Like you'd have to have a company that is willing to take out one of these decentralized loans only because uh, at high interest rate, only because the banks denied them. There's no other reason for them to do that. If the risk reward is lower on a centralized bank, they're going to go for a centralized bank. So I do think there's like, there is some very niche market for this. And as regulation gets more clear or as VCs are more willing to invest on chain just because it's faster, it's more international, it's decentralized, it's permissionless. So anyone from anywhere in the world can invest in like an American company or a Senegal company or, you know, a Chinese company or even a North Korean company, who knows? Uh, I think that's one of the, the major plays. But, uh, you know, risk reward is always going to normalize yields over time. I yeah, do think the way things I... like LandX are super interesting. Are you familiar with LandX? No, I'm not familiar with LandX. So this is a cool protocol. I mean, I've, I've loved them for a long time. They've had a hard time, like, getting a lot of traction. But basically, this protocol has decentralized uh, farming. So you, have, you can buy the rights to, like, a hectare of corn yield. And so they're going to sell that corn on the market. And then whatever the value of that corn is, you're going to get the value of that. So they have these derivatives that represent the yield of a hectare of corn or wheat or soy. Uh, They have all these farmers. They have legal contracts with them. So if they don't produce or whatever, they get the rights to that land. Uh, And all of this goes back to the token holders. I think it's a phenomenal model. I don't know if it'll be successful long term, but that's the sort of thing that I think DeFi is so perfect for or crypto is is like the exact right use case for yeah no i agree in that same model like um um my wife's parents are really into like regenerative regenerative farming so it's um mm-hmm. this concept it's like uh, above organic right it's about like uh, you know we've killed most of the soil in the u.s it's about regenerating that soil soil is like a living organism and so it's supposed to hold water and do all these things that it doesn't do today because we don't even we just screwed it up so much. Right. But imagine like there's so there's people that are really passionate about that, but maybe don't have the money to buy the land and, and to do these things. And if you connect them with the right people, they're like, hey, I want maybe the benefit of that, or I would mm-hmm. love to see this happen. They're investing in it. And then the yield that comes from that later down the line is getting poured back into the token or, or something like that. And so that's when I say real yield. I mean, like maybe you have a startup kind of VC sector of crypto, uh, but maybe down the line, it's, most of those will fail, like just like anything, like 90%, 99%. Sure. But out out of that maybe comes like the next, you know, big farming company or the the next Apple or something like that. Instead of Apple launching uh, through private uh, markets, today maybe the modern Apple would launch through as as a crypto startup if we had the regulation right. And that's where I think we'd see finally real yields coming into crypto. And the only way to really solve this is to get better regulation so that any company can essentially kick – it's almost like Kickstarter. Any company can raise on a global scale – using crypto to get started and and uh, get that company going. 
Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that where you're like, not that you're discounting, but that is maybe an unknown uh, vertical here is leverage. I know that leverage is scary and it should be scary. It should be terrifying. Yeah. But when you have composable DeFi assets, so when I'm literally holding a token representing a hectare's worth of corn yield, I can then take that, uh, put it into some decentralized money market like Morpho, like Silo, like Dolomite, and then borrow stable coins against it and buy more of that, which takes my $1 invested into this, let's just say, sustainable farm and turns it into $1.50 because I can leverage using the same amount of initial capital Increasing my risk, absolutely, uh, but then also increasing the total capital going to this farm while I am getting a leveraged exposure to the yield of that or the success of that business. Now, again, leverage is scary. Please be responsible with it. But the fact of the composability of an investment in the DeFi space makes the capital so much more efficient uh, than in TradFi. Uh, but imagine like how fun it would be if, like, say, say Apple was here and you're like taking the the yearly or the the dividend or whatever, right? And so you and have that, that like yeah. you have a wrapped token of that. You're you're using it to build other products. So you have like Apple dividend for a stable coin. It's like a little bit of ETH yield, a little bit of Apple dividend, a little bit of this, 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 uh, maybe some real estate yield. And now you're building a completely new financial product or you're looping all those things to get a yield over in this area. Those kind of things fascinate me and sound really, really fun. And like we could build some really amazing things um, that, that we currently couldn't do today because of the way that the traditional financial system is versus crypto. And I see that like on the horizon and I think, wow, crypto, it's not like we're just going to take in, you know, uh, we're not just going to tokenize assets today, but we're going to literally create these entire new uh, sectors of financial assets that can't exist today using crypto uh, that's going to open up all these kind of crazy doors. Composability makes all of this just dramatically more interesting. So you could take the yield of anything, whether it be dividends, whether it be actual crops, whether it be the, the return on a business, uh, whether it be a speculative investment, get the yield on that and then neutralize it. So a lot of mutual funds only want fiat denominated uh, products or investment vehicles. And so if the if there are 50 different infrastructure pieces that are all competing to have the most efficient shorting mechanism or borrowing mechanism or interest rate for a product, then it makes the cost to short, cost to neutralize really low. If the yield outpaces the cost to neutralize, then you have a very compelling, let's just say delta neutral product or investment vehicle that you can turn into a vault, an ERC 4626 or 2646, whatever the standard is. Then you have this vehicle that anyone can invest in that is doing something very complicated on the back end, a decentralized mutual fund where you can see exactly what they're doing on the blockchain so it's completely transparent i mean this is this is a, like a uh, the financial dream in my opinion yeah and i think uh, i mean i don't know enough about uh all of this to, to really go into detail on it but i do think about the possibility of like even my own house there's got to be value that i could unlock like say it was tokenized right there's got to be a value in like being able to lend against it or like I, I, obviously there's some danger there, but I think you could probably safely do certain aspects of that or like say I rented it out and I could like use some of that yield and like go do something with it. You, you know what I mean? Like there, there, it opens up all these weird financial possibilities and niches that you don't have today where you can um, or, or my business, right? Like I, it, with a business or any of these things where you can say, hey, like I want to add my business to as backing for this financial asset, or I want to add the yield from my business to backing from this financial asset. And so maybe you have this like, uh, maybe that's like liquidity and like, you know, you have a platform that's like, hey, we have a thousand small businesses generating this much yield and this is our token and it, you know, the yield goes to these token holders, et cetera. And that opens up maybe funding for those businesses where they can tap in because they're given a certain allocation of that token. All these weird possibilities that you don't have today that, that this uh, would in the future, I think, unlock. And this is where like the, the argument of regulation, like pro-regulation versus anti-regulation comes in because anti-regulation, which I am very sympathetic towards, I think that there is a need for decentralized finance in a way that you own your own assets. No one can seize or freeze them. There is no government. There is no bad actor. There's no entity in the world that could determine that you are not worth having those investments and then take them away uh, by forcing themselves to like seize or freeze. Like, I, I like that. I think if you look at the, the Canadian uh, truckers who are protesting, whether or not you agree with them, the fact that the government could say, we don't like what you're protesting for. We don't like the way you're expressing your, your speech. And therefore, we're going to freeze your assets that's terrifying to me because today maybe it's attacking conservatives but maybe tomorrow it's attacking liberals or tomorrow it's attacking you whomever you might be and so decentralized finance as a hedge against that against like overreach in general i think is phenomenal 
The flip side of that is that with complete decentralization, you are fully responsible for your assets. So if you tokenized your house and then someone hacked your wallet and took your house, uh, that terrifies me, right? You're like, you know, you're lending at your house and North Korea now owns your house five days later because you entered your seed phrase into a phishing site. And then, and then you, know, you have to move. I think that kind of stuff is terrifying. So there is certainly a demand and need and like love of regulation in this space uh, that is healthy. But also at the same time, I think, you will always have decentralized finance because there is always also this desire for freedom, the Wild West, and, and self-agency and ownership. I, I Thinking it through a little bit more, maybe let me put it this way. Imagine like a chain like Starbucks, okay? Mm -hmm. And I mean, they've gone, uh, they've IPO'd, they have stock, they have all this funding, all this expansion research, et cetera. Uh, it's really hard as like maybe a mom and pop uh, coffee shop to compete against that. Uh, but there's uh, so many cool like niche. I don't know if you if you like coffee shops, but there's so many cool coffee shops all over uh, the U.S. And like I prefer like going to those, the local ones, over say a Starbucks. Um, imagine if they could all band together, all these separate decentralized coffee shops, and like into this kind of uh, protocol where um, they're represented as a whole, their cash flows represented as a whole, and again, they it's it's kind of like IPOing, but for this big old network of coffee shops. And then, like, you can look at it all on, on chain. Like, this coffee shop's doing this yield, this yield, this coffee shop's doing this yield. And you can kind of prioritize, like, okay, uh, we're going to move funding over from this one. We're going to do a second right. location for this one because it's doing really well. Um, and you get the kind of idea. Like, it opens up these weird models that you could never do that today. You just couldn't have anything like that today. And theoretically, you could do this through governance. So you can have, I mean, this is also scary because governance is all oligop oligarchy or, or oligopolies in uh DeFi or in crypto, you know, the person who has the most tokens has the most say in governance, and this can be positive or it can also be malicious, but the same thing happens with stocks, right? If you can buy enough shares of stock, you can also have disproportionate uh, say over the company's direction to some extent. Uh, but yeah, I mean, on-chain mutual funds, which is effectively what you're describing, and then having some governance model to direct how those mutual funds are operate with savvy enough investors could be, I guess, you know, what I call the future of France, like really, really big verticals for DeFi in general. Yeah, because I imagine like... Um they get to tap into that funding. The capital, and right. They, yeah, they get capital and like say like whatever percent like revenue they're bringing in was like their, their percent ownership in the overall whatever token that represents that conglomerate of coffee shops. And so, and they can get kicked out if say like they don't perform to a certain degree or something. I don't know exactly how it would work, but I, I just, <laughs> it, it gets me excited about like, it seems like the way that the markets work today is, is very centralizing. We have so many chains and like, I hate when I go into a town, it's like just chain, 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 chain. And it would be cool if we could get more like diversity and like even just thinking coffee shops, restaurants, et cetera, through something like this, allowing, allowing the smaller businesses to compete. Or when we go back to the farms, right? Like we have these giant pharmaceutical companies or, or whatever, big agriculture, owning these uh, giant swaths of land, really killing that land, killing, uh, making these really toxic crops, et cetera. But imagine if we could decentralize to all these small farms and allow them to um, give them the resources so that they can thrive and succeed. And so I, I really think if you take a lot of concepts and you decentralize them and you expand them out, they do better. And the more you centralize them, the more kind of like gross and toxic they end up getting over time. Yeah. I mean, th this vision is something that I'm, I'm fully bought into and I think I agree with. The, my only concern is that we end up in the same place because if you are saying, I want to fund X, Y, and Z farm as an example, it's typically only if you apply these standards. And then once once governance gets tainted by just the wrong entity that says, okay, now I'm in control, I'm determining the standards, it, it, you fall back into the FDA or any regulatory agency that effectively strangles the, the businesses by, by regulatory bodies. But if it's decentralized enough, or maybe there is a chance that there will always be some good actors with someone with enough capital to, to consistently decentralize fund these things. Yeah, and I think the goal would be you'd want the end consumer to be the one that kind of has the biggest vote and ownership, right? So right. like, Ideally, the, the governance is run by not only these, say it was farms, not only the farms, but also the like, like the end consumer. And so like right. together, it like becomes this almost like a sustaining loop, right? Like they're buying yeah. it. They're more motivated to buy it because they own it. Uh, they're getting exactly. revenues from when they buy it. And it becomes this they're really nice. They're invested in the products they buy, which is fantastic. Because then, then they want a good product. They want a healthy product. They want a sustainable product. Uh, and there are, I mean, at this point, we have such a stratified such so as it's so weird. We have such a stratified class system in the U.S. that we have an entire class of people, which is a grow, an interestingly growing class of individuals who have enough capital to to 
purchase based on ethics. And so they're, you know, buying what they perceive to be like organically, sustainably farmed things are entire chains right now. I think like Whole Foods is kind of capitalizing on this. Trader Joe's is kind of capitalizing on this, uh, not the decks, but the actual market chain. And yeah. as a result, you know, we, we're seeing an interesting restructure of regulations, an interesting restructure of branding. And so if this could come on chain and we could have an ethics driven uh, capitalist system, then yeah, sure. We could, we could really, uh, incentivize monetarily ethical systems, which is what we always yeah. needed to do at the end of the day. <laughs> what we need to do is make it profitable to be ethical because otherwise the incentives are misaligned. If the incentives are profitable to be unethical rather than profitable to be eth the ethical, people will always be unethical because I mean, unfortunately, like the average person will always be unethical because the average person will do what they're incentively aligned to do. Yeah. And I guess maybe that's a good way to expand it out is, um, when, when you're talking, it made me think, uh, regulatory capture, like a, a lot of markets get ruined because of regulatory capture, um, mm -hmm. medical mark, like if, if you have insurance of any kind, you know, it's like so overpriced, any medical procedure, so overpriced. There's so much regulatory capture there. Food industry, there's a lot of regulatory capture, the military industrial complex, there's a lot of regulatory capture. And so, um, you know, the, again, the more centralized you get these things, the smaller they get, the more right. they are inefficient and, and actually bad. And so the more mm -hmm. you can spread these things out and get get things to a free market state where you have like just a everything again decentralized a lot of things a lot of competing factors um the the, the end result is better for everyone and so i think you have governance be like proof of purchase so you have to prove that you're a customer in order to have a larger uh weighted share of governance yeah <laughs> yeah that i mean that'd be great yeah it, at, and the more if you stop purchasing or you're you're not doing that like you lose out on, on those votes and the way it works. Yeah, your waiting goes down. I think there's something. Like, I, again, I don't, it's, it's hard because it's such a vague concept in my head. Sure. But I do feel like there's something to tap into here uh, that gives power to the masses in a very decentralized way uh, that we couldn't tap into before because of the way that, like, kind of p power worked in, in, the, in a traditional model. Well, absolutely. Um, this also, can also solve a lot of like the, the community problems. So let's just say there's like a, a suffering community that's trying to start up small businesses and there's no real way to invest in those businesses from an insider's perspective. So like w one of the ways you want to do this is go to like local shops, people, you know, things like that. But if you could invest in your own community, like if there was an index, an on-chain index that was a representation of like your specific community or your local uh, economic sphere, and you could just like invest in that. That would be a much easier way or much more reliable way to boost your own internal community, especially like struggling communities. And there's also benefactors who just want to invest in other people's communities. So uh, I, I did think it could solve a lot of problems. It just we need so much more infrastructure before we get there. Yeah, people love what they own, too. Like if you could own some of the yield from your city, you could own some of the yield from your state, like weird things right. like that. If we could tap into it, I feel like people would treat their cities and their states better. There's right. some sort of like utopian model in crypto. I swear it just needs to be unlocked. And we don't know. I don't know how to access it yet. It's going to take some experimentation and some major failures. But I think if we keep iterating and trying new things and kind of pushing this model to the, the limits, we will unlock something that we don't have today that, that is going to be really interesting. And I think overall a net good. Again, it, yeah, I, I think you're right. It's the battle between MEV, which is the, the people who are right now just saying, how can I maximally extract value from this for myself and not care about any, any other consequences of this? And just flipping the switch with one correct product that correctly incentivizes good behavior. If we can figure that out, if we can like crack that code of how to correctly incentivize good behavior in a way that makes people profitable, uh, then I think like we're off to the races and people will replicate it. You want people to fork good behavior. Everything is incentives. The more and more I think that's like by, you know, I'm like a maxi for free markets. And the reason yeah. is because the incentives, the incentives mm -hmm. are, you know, people want to make a lot of money. They're going to compete right. on that field to provide solutions to problems people have. And the people that solve the biggest problems the, in the best way are going to make the most money. And when you mm -hmm. mess with that free market, when you mess with those incentives and say, hey, I don't care how big of a problem you solve, um, you're not going to make any extra money. We're going to all make equal money. Well, guess what? Now you switch the incentives. Now people don't want to solve problems. Right. They're not yeah. going to work 80-hour work weeks and go through all this pain to fix these things. And so everyone's net like, uh, you know, living standards is going to go down. And so mm -hmm. you're right. Everything is incentives. And if you nail those right, it's insane what, what people can do. But if you mess those up, it, it destroys everything. 6,000% APR on picking up litter. 
you know, <laughs> just <laughs> figuring it out. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, that is that is like all pie in the sky. It's really idealistic. I hope we get there. I do hope that like there are some on-chain incentives that aren't like the oh, what's the the thing that China has um, social credit systems. You know, yeah. social credit systems seem like a lot of the end goal from for utopian visions, and that terrifies me because a utopia can quickly turn into a dystopia. I'm thinking about a brave new world, which was either a utopian book or a dystopian book, depending on who's reading it. Uh, you know, it, it certainly could be uh, a solution to this, but then it could be weaponized against people if, if used the wrong way. So the infrastructure is a good thing and a bad thing, and I really think we have to be careful when building these systems. But at the same time, it's, it's fun to theorize about what we could potentially incentivize and what the future could look like with on-chain technology. Imagine with government spending, I did not mean for the podcast to go this direction, but it's so interesting. Imagine with <laughs> government spending, if like, um, you know, say the government wanted to do something like we want to build this bridge or this high-speed rail or whatever, it, right. if they operated on an intent-based model, where they were like, okay, our intent is we would like right. to build this high speed rail from here to here. Actually, our intent is now we that. need solvers. We need like ten thousand solvers yeah. all over the U.S. who are figuring out what is the best, most efficient way to do this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Our intent is we want to go from San Francisco to L.A. in the shortest amount of time possible in a safe way that you know can handle this many people a day. And then you mm -hmm. leave it to the market to say, hey, right. who, who can execute on Here's, this vision? Here's, you know, the best? $50 million or whatever. Now the solvers have to figure it out how to get it done and then it gets done. Yeah. It, it, making yeah. that actually efficient and work would be, would be <laughs> incredible. Uh, well, you know yeah, what? We're, I, we're doing it here first, right? Uh, what was it? Aperture, which what a, what a, what a rough airdrop, but still a really cool product. I think, you know, pro products that are doing intense will uh, change the landscape of DeFi and hopefully the landscape of humanity in the, in the far future. But, yeah, very, very cool potentials. Yeah, I think intents already are. I mean, have you used a cross as a bridge yet? In, yeah, any yeah, yeah, uh, Dude, which I, is chain abstraction. Yeah, yeah. And, and oh, it's not it, so cross anymore, though. It's Everclear. No, no, that's... Um, that's Connect. You're talking right, about sorry. Connect. I'm getting Connect and Cross mixed up. Yeah, a cross is uh, intense based And I mean, I've, I've literally bridged between chains in like four seconds. It's yeah. insane. It, it used mm -hmm. to be like 30 minutes. And it's like four seconds with uh, a cross. It blows my mind. And then cow swap... Uh, cow protocol I, I love them too because like every time i go on there it's like they show me how much i saved by using yeah. them and mm -hmm. yeah intents are awesome i mean so they, they aggregation well. was the first thing right and then optimizing aggregation and then intents are like the next layer of of this optimized system are you familiar with the uh, xcrc20 tokens uh no so XCRC20 tokens are effectively the mint burn mechanism from IBC. So instead of actually needing a what you can call a honeypot for bridges, uh, we saw so many bridge exploits in the last bull run. Effectively, what that means is you have a big pot of tokens on one side of the bridge, a huge yeah. pot of tokens on the other side of the bridge, and the tokens minted on each side are, are backed by that huge pot. So if that, bot, if that pot gets rugged or exploited, those tokens on whatever, whichever side of the bridge are effectively valueless because they're only claims to that pot. XERC20 tokens are a representation of the natively issued token on every chain they exist on. And instead of having big pots, they're minted and burned as they're transferred, which is the, the IBC mechanism. So there is no pot to exploit or tap into. Now, the biggest like threat here would be if someone could hack the minting mechanism and mint infinity of these and then sell them on the market, which we've seen a couple times with uh, like LR LSTs. I think like Anchor was one of the big ones that got exploited this way. But XR XERC20s have a like minting cap, so you can never actually you can't exploit them to that extent. Anywho, I think this particular infrastructure makes intent so much more interesting because you can effectively immediately bridge without any risk of like the exploitation of the underlying being worthless. Yeah, I, I so I haven't heard of that um, specific model, but I know Wormhole has like their standard for that. There's a couple different standards. Yeah, there are a few different standards. 20. That's right. Layer zero so also has their own. Yeah, or maybe I might even be thinking of Layer Zero. They have their own, but like it's the same idea that like yeah, in, instead of doing the honey pots, you burn it on one side, mint it on mm -hmm. the other side, and I, I really I think that is a good model for like cross chain tokens versus the honey pot. Um, and and I, but the hard part is those a lot of these older tokens have to go reissue a token with, under that standard. So like, oh man, I, like we're, I was supposed to talk about yields and we're talking about infrastructure. That's totally fine. Uh, there's also <laughs> settlement layers. So uh, Everclear is working on this. I think Hyperlane may also be working on this in the future, but effectively 
they're batching transactions to make transactions instant. So instead of having the issue where like I'm sending a relayer signal over there, but it's not going to mint or burn until gas is efficient. What it's doing is batching transactions like L2s work. So it's saying, okay, we have, we know that X amount of transactions will probably cost X, Y, and Z over time because we have these robust models. Let's just immediately settle that transaction and then, or, you know, immediately send that transaction and then settle it at the end of the day. And so like these sound cool for bridging it makes a lot of sense right you have a bunch of bridges happen and then you look at the the net uh mint burn across two chains you settle at the end of the day with one transaction it's very efficient this gets super interesting when you look at intense so let's just say you know you have an abstracted layer where i want to deposit into aperture on base chain at 5x leverage and borrow against it on arbitrum and then lp into uniswap i have that intent now that takes a lot of bridging these these settlement layers can say, okay, you know what? I will credit you for that transaction. I'll open that position for you uh, because I know what that'll cost. And then I'll batch that transaction together with a bunch of other transactions. At the end of the day, I'll settle those. Like that's how credit card companies work. Credit card companies do not send and settle every transaction immediately. They batch them in like large chunks of, of millions of transactions uh, for cost efficiency. I think it's, it's not like no one's going to get a yield on it. It's not particularly interesting from a DeFi farmer's perspective, but from an infrastructure perspective, uh, batched, settled, complex transactions are are going to increase the efficiency of this space by so much. I mean, that, that's how CowSwap and Cow Protocol work. So they do a batch mm -hmm. auction mechanism where everyone's, they take the, the intents, um, the solvers look at the entire batch. So like uh, everyone's doing orders, it right. gets thrown into a batch, and the solvers look at the whole batch, and then they try to solve that batch in, in the best way possible for all participants. And in some cases, that's where they get their name, coincidence of wants, where they'll look at in that batch, if there's one person wanting to sell the same asset that another one's wanting to buy, they'll just pin them together and say, okay, we're exactly, going to completely right. bypass the liquidity. But yeah, you're right. It opens up a whole world of, of new efficiencies that we don't get today because uh, it, everything's a one-off transaction. And we've built all this infrastructure literally from the ground up. I mean, uh, you can look at Morpho as a predecessor to this. So Morpho had, we'll use lending markets, we'll tap into Aave, we'll tap into Compound or whatever. But if we have uh, two peers that are looking to effectively do the opposite transaction, we'll just match them together. Like that was the very, very, very base form of what would later become like batch transactions. And now we have of hyper complex versions of this, which is uh, like you said, intense. And CowSwap is a great example because those auctions to solvers, they're incentivizing the most efficient solver. And so, like we go back to incentive alignment. When you're incentivizing this really good, really efficient behavior, you get phenomenal infrastructure and efficiency. Uh, so let's just hope we continue along that angle, and then up only in a few months. A few more liquidations and up only. Well, this podcast definitely went a different direction than I intended <laughs> it to go. I think we'll have to probably circle around and do one just focused on DeFi. This ended up being like more like the frontier of crypto and all the places and weird things that could happen and are happening. And it ended up being one of my favorite episodes ever. But uh, <laughs> I, you, you are an expert in DeFi and I didn't want to get into that. So I'll, we'll have to cir circle around and get into that because I feel like we'd talk for another hour if we jumped into that right now. Um, I guess as a last question, um, as far as like the crypto space right now and looking at the market, I don't know if this is really your specialty or not, but I'm, I am curious to know, where do you see the market going from here? Um, it seems like we're in a lull period. Um, where would you guess it, or how would you guess crypto plays out over the next year or two? Year or two, that gets rough. So... Uh, <laughs> Or six months, or however you want to answer that. Based off of a lot of macro indicators, we are in a bear market again. You know, the the weekly EMA cross, if you're into that kind of thing, has crossed bearish. So we are, we would be technically in a, in a bear market according to many macro indicators. If you're looking at super cycle as a systemic indicator, we are technically still in a bull market. We might just be in a trough uh, before a, a big pump. We're also in an election cycle tends to be the case that election cycles are bullish. We have seen a bit of a bull market prior to this sort of like very down and crabbish and choppy uh, portion. I think that's because there's just a lot of uncertainty. But the cool thing is, is we have things like poly market where you can hedge your bets. So I think one of the most fascinating things is that people are betting on Kamala as a hedge against her winning. So if they bet on her and she wins, they get, you know, a, a 2x multiplier. And if crypto goes down, they've hedged. So like they, they still technically win. It's a really, really fascinating way to hedge bets. So 
now we have a disproportionate share of Kamala voters as a hedge against. So you have crypto, which is an industry that is antagonistic towards, let's just say, the Democratic Party at the moment. Uh, that may change in the future. Hopefully it does. And betting on a Democratic candidate as a hedge against the success. It's. I think all of these things are absolutely fast. Go ahead. Where did you where did you hear that? I've never even heard this concept. It makes a lot of sense. Um, is this like <laughs> so your I own theory you. or... Uh, yeah. No, this is so I, I run what I like to call like the largest decentralized think tank in crypto, which is like the DeFi Dojo. We have a thousand members, a hundred super active members. We have members from teams like the DeFi Llamas are in there. The Morpho guys are in there. All the LRT protocols are in there. And we just talk crypto all day long and yield all day long. We recently opened a poly market channel and people were like, oh, yeah, no, I'm hedging the elections or I'm, I'm hedging my crypto portfolio by voting for Kamala. It's a 1.8x return if if she wins. And so if my portfolio goes down. Who cares? And I was like, that's brilliant. That's like, it's so clever. Uh, so, and like, there are ways on poly market where you could create a delta neutral bet uh, and get like a fixed rate 5% return because of the inefficiencies between the different poly market. I mean, it's just a lot of fun to do all that kind of stuff. I highly recommend joining the DeFi Dojo. A lot of gigabrains there. I, you know, it's always said if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. I am never the smartest person in the room in the DeFi Dojo. So uh, that's where I'm getting these ideas from, or at least many of them. That is a really, really interesting take and does explain kind of a discrepancy that I've seen when I've um, I've pulled people on Twitter, I've pulled people on YouTube. And when I poll, what I see is like 80% of them say they're voting for Trump. Um, but, you know, the poly market, I'd show it 50-50. I, I, did, I have seen a discrepancy of if I pull the same audience and ask who they think will win, it drops down to uh, 70%. I think you'll win. So 80% are voting, 70% think you'll win. And usually when I ask why they, they think that, um, th it's usually some form of like they believe that there's going to be some form of cheating or they believe the cards are stacked against them because of the way the media is or whatever. Um, so I, I think that does play into some of the odds on poly market is there's a segment that's wanting to vote for Trump but believes he's going to lose because of this factor or this factor or this factor. Um, but then I've never thought about the hedge angle. That is really, really interesting. I've never even heard people. I hear a lot of people talk about poly market. I've never even heard people talk about that. So that's uh, a really interesting take. Yeah, there are so many interesting verticals. So like, I guess like back to the question, where are the crypto, where, where is the market going? Um, to be honest, we have so many interesting things happening. Sony launching an L2, people building things like poly market, which are f fantastically interesting for everyone all over the world, not just DeFi users. And like they have a compelling market fit. Uh, I do think that DeFi is going to be a large portion of financial interest in like the next 10 years. So still very bullish on the sector. Uh, immediate price action. If I look at charts, I'm not really a chart guy. It looks like we're going down for a while, which stinks because I'm like turbo long ETH. Uh, that is mostly my portfolio. I'm a DeFi maxi. Uh, hopefully I'm wrong. Hopefully we get some tailwinds. I think a, a Trump presidency would obviously be a fantastic tailwind. Uh, hopefully we, we resume up only that, that 10 ETH locked in it's programmed that comes back into narrative. We all make a bunch of money. Uh, we exit, we all get a bunch of yachts and then build the future of, of DeFi together. That's um, I, I would, I would think the exact opposite. So I'm, I'm in the other camp where I think September could be rough. Historically, it's not a great month, but historically like right. October through February is like just crypto season. That's where the strength right. is. Right, liquidate everyone and then go up from there, yeah. Yeah, plus like you said, we have a lot of strength going into the election. We have rate cuts coming. Um, if you look at like the typical four year cycle, like this is when things start going parabolic is would be about October. So I feel like there's a lot of factors going. And plus we have the ETFs now. We have the ETFs. We've worked our way through a good portion of this outflows. Um, I don't know. I feel like we're going into some strength. I know a lot of the chart guys are saying the opposite. I've seen a lot of chart guys saying we're going to 30K. We're going to 30K. We're going to 30K. And I, I mean, they're looking at the chart, but I'm looking at like everything else. And I'm like, man. I don't see that same thing, but I'm not a chart guy, so maybe that could be it. <laughs> well, hey, I, I'm a yield guy, so I, I denominate my portfolio in ETH. Sometimes I'm a delta neutral guy. I think last, last bear market, I was delta neutral through the entire time. There are ways to get yield on all of that, so I think that really uh, just having a thesis and then getting yield on that thesis is, is the major benefit of DeFi in general. Well, uh, Stephen, it has been great having you on. This has been, like I said, one of the most interesting episodes I think I've ever had because of the weird place it went. I will have you back on to talk about DeFi at some point in the future because I really want to get into that. Um, but as always, none of this is investment advice. You should always do your own research. Crypto is risky and you should never invest more than you're willing to lose. I really should have, like pause and like let you say, hey, you know, thanks for having me on. But for some reason, I just I didn't. I, just, I suck at ending podcasts. So I'll end it there. <laughs> well, hey, thanks for having me on.